So the, the loss of Dr. Maureen is not just a loss for today. It sets back neurology and Gaza for, I would say, something like 10 years. The Electronic Intifada. The Electronic Intifada. The Electronic Intifada. This is the Electronic Intifada podcast. I'm Nora Barrows-Friedman. And I'm Asa Winstanley. I'm Nora Barrows Friedman, and this is the Electronic Intifada podcast. We turn to the situation in the Gaza Strip. Days before the ceasefire went into effect in mid-May, after 11 days of Israeli bombing, United Nations human rights experts raised alarm over the deteriorating humanitarian conditions in Gaza, particularly in regards to its healthcare system. Quote, it has been starved of equipment, medicines, and trained staff. It is buckling under the ravages of the COVID-19 pandemic, and now it is trying to treat the more than 2,000 Palestinians injured during this latest violence, the rights experts said. Only around 2% of Gaza's residents have been fully vaccinated against COVID-19, and, and an Israeli airstrike damaged the only testing lab in the territory, temporarily shutting it down. When Israeli airstrikes were destroying or damaging homes, office buildings, and roads over those 11 days, tens of thousands of Palestinians were forced to shelter in UN facilities with little ability to socially distance or or protect each other from the spread of COVID-19. Joining us to talk about the health situation in Gaza is our good friend, Dr. Tarek Lubani. Tarek is an emergency room physician and works with the GLIA Project, an open source 3D printed medical equipment program that was working in Gaza. GLIA's manufacturing offices were damaged in the attacks. Tarek, thank you so much for being with us again on the Electronic Intifada podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Nora. So you work directly with physicians at Shifa Hospital, the main trauma center in the Gaza Strip. Um, During those 11 days of the latest attacks, Israel targeted the roads leading to Shifa. Um, Let's start with that and what physicians there were dealing with in those emergency situations. The situation in Gaza, even before the strikes, was absolutely terrible, as you and many of your listeners and viewers will know. What transpired afterwards was really unprecedented, even for a group of physicians and medical practitioners who are used to very much uh, terrible, aggressive uh, wars. It's not like we don't know what war looks like. If anything, uh, we as a medical community in Gaza tend to be understated and reserved. So uh, I wasn't allowed to go into Gaza of course, the Israelis kind of banned everybody from the north and the Egyptians from the south. Um, But all the reports that I was getting were saying things that I wasn't used to hearing from people who I know don't exaggerate. And when we started to see attacks on the medical infrastructure and not just the medical infrastructure of the hospitals but the medical infrastructure around the hospitals that prevented a pre-hospital response, that that was shocking and obviously disturbing. At the moment, of course, we're, we're now in the post period and what we're seeing is all of the devastation that's left behind. The death toll is probably not yet complete. And despite this, we're, we're still uh, becoming aware of how much we've lost in terms of infrastructure and in terms of clinics, hospitals, and so on. Uh, For example, the Indonesian hospital is damaged. I believe it was a number of three hospitals and six uh, six to 10 other medical healthcare clinics that are assessed to be damaged to varying degrees. And that number is expected to increase as more assessments are made. Can you talk a little bit about the the impact that this 14-year-old siege has had on the med... I know we've talked about this before um, on this podcast, um, but but give us a sense of, of... of what uh, a normal situation looks like for uh, for doctors, um, you know, with access to all the equipment and infrastructure uh, that that is provided, and then what it looks like with um, you know medical staff in the Gaza Strip, completely sealed off, subjected to this cruel uh, draconian siege for fourteen years. Um, and then, and then, you know, a pandemic 
um, where no one is able to get vaccinated. Um, and then 11 days of bombing. What, I mean, what does the situation look like right now inside the clinics and, and in the, you know, in the pharmacies, in the supply closets right now? I have the bittersweet experience of uh, practicing both in Gaza and the Gaza Strip, which has the worst equipped, um, the worst set up hospitals in the world, and in Canada, in, in a province called Ontario, where we have probably the best hospitals in the world. And truly to be able to compare and contrast them, I mean, it's, it's incredible. The thing that bothers me the most isn't that Gaza is so poorly set up, but rather that it doesn't have to be. I've been in other parts of the world where you kind of get a sense that, yes, the situation is terrible, but the problems are so vast and so many that it would take years, if not decades, to fix things. In Gaza, it's not like that. Almost everybody who's practicing in Gaza right now, especially the older doctors, they remember a time when there wasn't a blockade, and they remember a time when they could order medical supplies and receive medical supplies, when they could provide almost first world type medical treatment for, uh, for the citizens in the Gaza Strip. So it's not long ago that things were different. And those talents, those skills, they're still largely there because those people have trained the people after them in how to use equipment. For example, when I go and I teach, I had asked them, well, do you want me to teach according to what you have? And they said, no teach according to the gold standard and will adapt to what we have. If the blockade were lifted tomorrow, I would dare say within a year, it would be operating at almost the same kind of capacity as a hospital like London, Ontario. And within five years, it would be able to match its capacity dollar for dollar, bed for bed, doctor for doctor. Take us through uh, the last 15 months of the COVID-19 pandemic and as a physician, as someone who works closely with uh, medical personnel at Shifa Hospital specifically, um, what your colleagues are, are saying uh, right now about the, the spread of the coronavirus, um, especially after uh, the attacks on Gaza. The medical system, as we had sort of said, was already non-functional and broken. It is not going to be broken. It is not failing. It has failed. Absolutely. Cannot provide the basics of medical health care for its patients. Cannot provide the basics of medical health care for the citizens in the Gaza Strip. It is failed. And on top of that, we added something that taxed so badly every other medical care system in the world. We're talking about uh, a pandemic that has destroyed really medical care in places like Canada, like the United States, that has killed millions, uh, millions and millions of people all over the world. So when it first came, uh, we knew that it was going to enter relatively quickly because by necessity, people are moving in and out. And the people in Gaza, the, the Ministry of Health in Gaza knew that the only chance that they had was to try to quarantine people who are coming in and out, to try to uh, use the blockade as a bit of an advantage and that there aren't that many people coming and leaving and thereby um, maybe delay it until the world had had a bit of a better strategy or maybe until there was a vaccine. They were able to delay it. I mean, they were able to delay it by almost a year. When the first wave finally started, it, it uh, really hit hard and it was instantly obvious that Gaza was incapable of dealing. Uh, it had a really interesting phenomenon where basically cases and deaths overlapped in, in terms of time. So how this should happen and how it happens in a first world country is that you have a case that you detect and then two weeks later or four weeks later or six weeks later, that patient might die. In Gaza, these detections weren't happening because the number of tests available was so low. Again, artificially so. It's not like the Ministry of Health in Gaza can't pay for it. It's not like everybody doesn't know that we need this, but you can't get out there and test because there aren't places where you can get out there and test. There aren't uh, enough tests, um, not just test locations, but testing swabs. And so what ended up happening was that we would only be detecting cases when people were severely ill as an attempt to 
uh, close the barn doors after the, the horses have gotten out. And obviously this meant that there was a severe undercount. We have a positivity rate, that is to say, number of tests versus uh, that are positive versus number of total tests that is today around 35% and has reached as high as 50%. In, in London, Ontario, it is pretty much never higher than 5% uh, because those are the kinds of numbers that would indicate that you have a positivity rate that's too high, you need to test more. So we know we're not testing enough. We know that it's more or less out of control. And we also know from experiences in other parts of the world, like Manaus and Brazil, that even after this disease has run its course through the community, a variant will pop up that does it again and again and again until finally we can vaccinate everybody. So the, the vaccine rate is disgustingly low and unnecessarily so. Uh, in Gaza, again, there, there is a lot of vaccine in Israel. There's a lot of excess vaccine in Israel. Israel has more or less uh, purchased and vaccinated, purchased more doses than they need and vaccinated uh, more people than, than, or not more people than they need, but rather a, a large number of people. So we know that there's vaccine available. We know that there's money to pay for it. And we know there's people who need it. So why isn't this happening? It's the blockade. Um, and you know, when a wave of COVID infections comes, um, as it as it will, uh, because people you know were huddling together during the eleven days of attacks, um, and there's no PPE in Gaza. Um, what are the choices that physicians have to make when when they have people you know who have been wounded by airstrikes by Israeli airstrikes? and people who are in need of um, a ventilator because of COVID. Um, walk us through the decisions, the decisions that physicians have to make right now. Uh, well, um, firstly, on the PPE question, there is no PPE to speak of. Uh, Glia has been producing face shields, which are usually part of the PPE uh, arsenal, not the whole PPE arsenal. And yet in places like Gaza, it is. We all saw horrific scenes from places like Italy, uh, New York, Washington State, where people were forced to reuse PPE. But in Gaza, they don't even have those masks to start with, let alone N95s, which are the gold standard for dealing with, with COVID positive patients. And not only that, but uh, if you've seen any of the images of ICUs, the ICUs are not room for room isolated. It's a pipe dream, it can't happen. It's not that we don't understand that you need negative pressure rooms, it's that you cannot do it. And that's for a number of reasons, one of which is that the machines required to do that are considered to be dual use by the Israelis, the, the filtration and cleaning, air cleaning machines. And so they're not allowed, they've never been really allowed in. So you have a situation where uh, doctors used to always have to make terrible decisions about who they would put on, on ventilators or not. Now with the war, it's a relatively easy decision because generally a trauma patient who arrives to the emergency alive is going to be uh, younger and more survivable than a COVID patient because it, it they tend to be older. And so in most cases where you only have one ventilator machine, you're gonna pick a young trauma patient over an old COVID patient. And so now obviously um, those patients are are being released under what's called the discharge to die, uh, which, which is to send them to their family so that they could die peacefully at home. That's terrible in all cases. In a case where this patient is spewing COVID uh, all over the place, it's a really terrible situation. Um, now you're talking about family who have to provide end of life care to patients where they know that in so doing, they are now going to get COVID and going to get sick and going to be in, in that terrible situation where maybe now their family has to take care of them. And so we are seeing entire families being basically decimated by, by this and just the way in which we have to do it. There is no social distancing, obviously. 
Um, and there's no social distancing, even within hospitals. They, they were too cramped before the attacks, they, before this war, I guess we can call it probably. Um, they are definitely too cramped after this war. Uh, a lot of people sort of talk about the countdown, which, which I thought was a little bit puzzling. There is no countdown. It never got better. The countdown really is in the numbers tested. The numbers tested decreased. And I remember even thinking like, wow, I can't believe 200 people got tested today in the middle of all of this. Um, and even then, obviously, the positivity rates were high. So the, the decrease in numbers that we see during the war, it's not because of, of fewer people getting it. It's because of fewer people getting tested. I don't think there was a dip. I don't think there will be a dip, uh, though very likely we are going to see a large, a large increase because people were huddled together. That increase is probably slightly offset by the fact that people weren't going to the markets and seeing other people. So I think in the end, it'll probably be a wash. The numbers are not likely going to change at all. And of course, um, Israel targeted the, the, the Gaza Strip's only uh, COVID testing facility. Um, and the, the head of the COVID response unit at Shifa Hospital uh, was killed in an Israeli airstrike, uh, as well as the, the, the Gaza Strip's only board certified neurologist. Uh, he was also killed. Um, and, and other doctors were, were uh, wounded and uh, or now made homeless. Um, talk, talk about your colleagues who were killed in the Gaza Strip in, in May. So um, to put sort of names to the titles here, Dr. Ayman Abul Auf was the head of COVID response, the chief of the internal medicine department. He was uh, an amazingly brilliant and absolutely generous human being who was always laughing um, and always sort of lifted the spirits of everybody around him. He was a beautiful, beautiful human being and a beautiful man. And his loss is big. It wasn't just him who died. It was him and his family. I believe there was one surviving member, but I'm actually not entirely sure that even one of his family survived. Uh, Dr. Moeen Lalul, uh, was Gaza's only board certified neurologist. He died um, and his wife, I believe also perished with him. They have a daughter who was uh, 24, 25, who survived um, and has severe facial burns as a result of the attack. Uh, one other doctor whose name I don't believe has been released publicly just yet was severely wounded uh, in an ambulance during one of the attacks. And I think as soon as that um, the family is, and everybody else is sort of aware, and he gives permission that, that, that his name will probably be released. And uh, he was an intensive care doctor, so you know this, these are these are people who are very important um, in a place where there aren't that many. I mean, these are scarce resources. If I get killed in London, Ontario, well, there are 90 emergency doctors here. Uh, if an emergency doctor were to get killed in Gaza, that's one of five people. If, uh, well, when, when this board certified neurologist got killed, that, that wiped out 100% of the board certified neurologists in Gaza. Uh, this internist, uh, Dr. Ayman, was one of the most senior, most experienced. These are, these are big deals. And for your listeners and viewers, you know, I want to paint a picture of what that particular attack on the COVID center looks like. So, there's a very big street called Al Wahda, which goes uh, in, I guess, probably a east-west direction, coming from Shifa. And this particular street is basically lined with medical establishments and medical institutions. And a few minutes up the road is where the Ministry of Health is based. The Ministry of Health has a relatively large building, which was severely damaged in the attack. Right beside it is where the COVID response is. Uh, a clinic called Riyadat al-Ramal or the Ramal Clinic. Right across the street is where Palestinian Children Relief Fund was, it's now destroyed, where Qatar Red Crescent Society was, I believe it's so damaged that they can't go back in there now, and where a bunch of other medical related NGOs are. 
you know, this is an area where literally every building houses either local or international medical organizations, including the Ministry of Health. There is nothing around there that is not medical, nothing. And it's obvious. I mean, from, from the air, I, I've obviously never overflown Gaza, but from the air, it's full of sort of red crescents and, and the symbols and flags of these institutions. And so there, uh, I'm not sure that somebody said, go take out Gaza's medical infrastructure. I don't think we can know that without a thorough investigation, but it doesn't matter. If this was an accident, it was a, an accident that still calls for severe accountability. And if it was not an accident, then that is, that is uh, even more unacceptable. How, um, I mean, how can, how, you know, t 2 million people and, and the only uh, certified neurologist has been killed. Um, what does that mean for Palestinian patients who have a neurolo neurological issue, uh, need, you know, neurosurgery? What does that mean right now for, for those patients um, and their families? Um, those patients are It's really quite that simple. And, you know, it's not that it's not just the death of one man. Uh, because one man may be replaceable. But, you know, I work on another project called Keys of Health in which we uh, take doctors who are in Gaza who have completed a certain portion of their training and want to subspecialize. A neurologist in most parts of the world starts out as an internal medicine doctor who subspecializes. And we do training. And we've been planning on training another neurologist. But let's say we bring this neurologist out to Canada, give her or him most of them um, are women in this program. Let's say we give her, him an absolutely amazing education and then send them back. Our plan was to send them back to work with Dr. Maureen because you need somebody domestically to orient this person, to help them understand the Gazan context and to mentor them. You know, as an emergency doctor, I'm now 10 years into practice. And despite that, I still go to my more senior colleagues and ask them questions tap their experience and knowledge, consult them on patients, uh, just as my more junior colleagues do with me. So the, the loss of Dr. Maureen is not just a loss for today. It sets back neurology and Gaza for, I would say, something like 10 years. And that's assuming that we're able to extract a doctor so that she or he can study in Canada and then get them back as quickly as possible. And you can imagine all of the barriers. There's huge barriers bringing them out. Lots of our doctors haven't been allowed out by the Egyptians or by the Israelis or both. And then there's huge barriers getting them back in. How do you send somebody back after they've lived in Canada? That's a very real question as well. So this is a problem. And, and I think that um, I would, um, I, I sort of, my heart bleeds for every patient who needs a neurologist right now in Gaza despite the fact that there are other people who are definitely going to try to pick up the slack and try their best. Let's talk about that a little bit too. Um, you've, you've talked about the indigenous um, kind of uh, mechanisms to, 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 you know, to fill gaps in knowledge, to fill gaps in supplies and medicines. Um, can you talk a little bit about how physicians are, are trying to, um, to fill those gaps right now? There are three major structural issues in the medical system right now. The first one is basic infrastructure. So we lack hospitals, we lack power, and we lack water, right? So these three things, without them, you can't run a hospital. You can't sterilize things. You can't see what you're doing. You can't run equipment. You can't be in a place. And so the building of institutions is not that hard. Um, yes, okay, there's a concrete problem, but generally you need to build a hospital only once, and then it's good for a very, very long time. The, the other things like solar power and like water are much more challenging because I think through a series of uh, probably necessity and bad decisions, the entire power structure in the Gaza Strip was built on uh, the assumption that diesel would always flow through or that electricity would always flow through from Israel or from 
Egypt. Uh, part of that is, of course, the Israelis have at times banned solar power. You know, you can't get it in if uh, you can't put it up if you can't get it in. And that was it was a huge problem. The Canadian government just yesterday announced $25 million of aid for Gaza, 10 million of which is dedicated to things like medical infrastructure development. And we're really hopeful that we can use this money so that we can uh, implement these sorts of projects. There are dangers, of course, because the last time Canada promised $50 million in 2018, very, very little, if any of that, arrived in Gaza, um, I think on the order of 100 to 500,000, though uh, I'm not entirely sure. I haven't seen the exact numbers. So this $25 million is promised, not delivered, and we have to see it delivered. And that's something that a lot of us will be pushing very hard for. If that project takes off, then we could potentially cure um, the electricity problems for some time to come because it would cover all of the primary healthcare clinics and a substantial amount of the remaining needs of the hospitals. Uh, it doesn't fix the water problem though. So we have a deep infrastructural problem. The other uh, big pillar is the pillar of uh, the equipment. So both disposable equipment like IVs, um, solutions, saline, medications, etc., and the non-disposable equipment, uh, think x-ray machines or um, operating room type tools and things like that. And that we're trying, in general, Gaza's trying to create indigenous manufacture of these things. So there's a few companies that work on a relatively traditional proprietary model um, that, that are trying to make medical devices. And then there's Glia, which, which I work heavily with and founded, which works on an open source model where basically we try to develop things and then release them out into the world and have as many people who can manufacture them just manufacture them, uh, taking their own profit as they see fit and then returning to that ecosystem of devices, whatever it is that, that they modify and improve. So there are those twin models that are happening. And between the two of them, you know, we could with enough supplies probably uh, account for all of our own needs. And then the last one, of course, is training. It's no good to have the best hospital in the world with all the equipment in the world if you have no training or people. And doctors in Gaza are amazing. They're incredibly courageous and brave, but it doesn't matter. You know, when I, um, I have, I'm obligated by my college to meet a certain number of hours of conferences and reading and continuing medical education. And if I don't do that, then my license is withdrawn. Well, in Gaza, where are people supposed to go for conferences? Who they do fellowships? You know, I've, I've, I can go to any country in the world to study any medical topic that I want. And that's a beautiful thing. That's how medicine progresses. Uh, and that's something that's missing in Gaza. So really, these are the problem spots. Uh, Palestinians are working very, very hard on fixing them. And uh, I think even with the blockade, as severe as it is, it has been absolutely incredible, mind-boggling, how much people have been able to fight back and, and gain their independence. Tarek, um, finally talk a little bit about Glia, and um, I, I know that its offices were damaged in the Israeli airstrikes. Um, can you can you talk? Like, are 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 there ways that people listening or watching this can support Glia, um, which is three D printing medical equipment like tourniquets and face shields and stethoscopes? Um, where should people be turning their attention and 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 you know financial help at this time? Uh, in terms of all of the projects that people can contribute to, to today, Medical Aid for Palestinians UK is really excellent. Uh, they do lots of medical related work. In the United States, uh, PCRF, I believe, is, is one of the major organizations that also does it. And Middle East Children's Alliance, I think, also has medical projects. So people can pick whatever charitable organization they want. In Canada, basically, it's Islamic Relief Canada, really, that, that's doing lots of the work. Um, with an emergency appeal, though there are a few others that are also doing some really great work. So I, I think they can look at that. If they want to work with GLIA or, or help contribute to GLIA, 
Uh, yes, so Teshkil 3D was our first partner and one of the major producers in Gaza and their offices were bombed. Uh, so they lost, we lost in Gaza, half of our 3D printing production capacity. Um, uh, Hamad Abu Matar, the engineer responsible, was clear-minded enough to be able to take a, a 3D printer from that group and just keep it at home just in case. And so one of their stock appears to have been uh, saved, though unfortunately the rest were destroyed. So he's still doing some of the work that he can. We are embarking on a really major project for tourniquets. We consider this to have been a near miss. We did not have enough tourniquets for ground invasion. Uh, we did not have enough tourniquets for any kind of major conflagration. And that's because for the past year, we've been producing PPE. So Glia's really, and Glia ran a very uh, large and very successful PPE for Gaza campaign, uh, where we made domestically lots of face shields and we try, we're trying still to import a bunch of respirators and 95 reusable respirators that the doctors and nurses um, and respiratory therapists in Gaza can use. Once that launches, uh, I'll pass it along to you, you can pass it along to your listeners and viewers. It uh, is launching soon, so it might even launch by the time this podcast is out. And I, I expect that it will be large and hopefully it'll be successful and will help us get a little bit ahead so that the next time that there is a major attack, we don't have to sit there biting our nails, wondering if we have enough tourniquets to make it work out. Anything else you wanna say about the current situation in Gaza and um, your uh, expectations or, or worst fears at this point? I think the biggest thing to say to the audience is that um, something very big has changed here. And I think all of us have watched Israel losing a deep cultural war. And that's really significant. But traditionally, we have done reasonably well to this point, talking about human rights abuses in places like Gaza, talking about the health situation in places like Gaza, and and really promoting a truthful narrative about what exactly is going on out there. However, we don't have legs, we don't have stamina. And so what is what will happen in the future, unless we're very careful, is that we're going to poop out, we're gonna run out of energy, stamina, attention, time, money, whatever. And the these stories that are now coming out about the human rights abuses, about the terrible healthcare situation that's happening there, they'll fade. And the narrative um, that we're more familiar with about how everybody in Gaza deserves to die anyway, and everybody's a terrorist anyway, and these doctors who are going in are part of the problem anyway, you know, all those narratives will resurface. So I think what I would say to your listeners and viewers is it's not over, stay strong, and let's not make the same mistakes we've made before of turning our attention away just because the bombs have stopped. Dr. Tarek Lubani, thank you so much uh, for all of your work and for being with us on the Electronic Intifada podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Nora. Thanks for watching this video. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit like, leave a comment. These engagements help us with the YouTube algorithm and it helps us to get around Silicon Valley censorship as much as possible. It does make a difference. You can also support our journalism by going to electronicintifada.net and clicking on donate now. Thank you.